get the recording started. Hi, my name is Roy Canterbury. I'm your host at Arch Talk 101, and we have Sean on the line with us. Uh, we're going to talk to him about his exciting archery uh, journey and what he's doing with archery. And uh, as we start off with, we'll have Sean introduce himself and tell us a little something about himself. Hi, guys. Like I said, my name's Sean Schrader. Uh, I'm one of the owners here at Double S Ranch. We're, we're outfitters here in, in uh, I want to say Central Texas, but it's a little more West Texas. We have a 2,700 acre ranch out here. Uh, I myself am a big bow hunter. Been started bow hunting. Who started when I was about 15. Uh, <laughs> didn't have much luck till I was probably 25, 30 before I actually <laughs> connected with something. Uh, nobody to help. Just wanted a bow, and my mom bought me a bow for my 15th birthday, and I fought it and fought it and fought it, and finally got my first doe when I was about 26, 27, and uh, man, you'd have thought I shot the biggest thing walking, and uh, kind of just been hooked ever since, and uh, I started outfitting about seven years ago, and uh, just kind of it turned hunting into a, my passion into a, into a, a living, basically. Uh, we got this ranch, and we've set it up for bow hunting, and, and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it sounds like it, and uh, you know, with the, do you have, do you guide, guide hunts then on, on your ranch or? Yes, sir. So like I said, this ranch is, I, I actually have two parts of my business. I have this ranch, which is my personal ranch, 2,700 acres. And we do guided archery hunts here. And then we also do some on, I work for a lot of, a lot of other ranches around central Texas and up into North Texas where we, where we do guided hunts. Also, we do exotics, we do whitetail, we do pigs, you name it. We've got a little bit of everything. That's kind of nice down there. I know a lot of ranches in Texas will have kind of some of the exotic animals that you can go down and hunt because, you know, they're raised. But, you know, people think, well, they're they're caged. No, when you have 2,700 no. acres, they're, they're not caged. <laughs> well, and I promise you, like, like for instance, these axis deer out here, they know every blade of grass on this ranch. They know it better than I do. And if one little blade of grass is out of position, they're not coming in. A feeder doesn't mean anything to them. Uh, they're... A, a, an axis deer will make a white tail look ignorant. They're tough. Oh, yeah. They are very, very tough. So, yeah, yeah it's uh, it, it's not for the faint of heart coming out bow hunting one of them guys. No, it, it, it does not. When you have that much land, too, there, there's, you know, they, they roam around all over. And I don't know about the axis deer, but the white tail's kind of pattern. But the mule deer we have right. in Nebraska, they just roam. You can't pattern a right. mule deer because they're not consistent. You know, they might be here well, one, one day and it might be a month before they get back. <laughs> well, and, and axes do the same thing. They they don't pattern up. There's no rhyme or reason why they do anything. Um, you know, like whitetail, you know, they you'll generally know when they're when they're gonna move around, but like my axes heard they rut their big rut is May, June, kind of into July a little bit, but mostly May and June. And uh so it, it's hot, so it's all day sits, and uh, they're going to come to water at some point during the day. You don't know if it's going to be six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock at night, midnight. It, there's no noon. There's no rhyme or reason why an axis does anything. I, I presume kind of like your mule deer. Yeah, it kind of sounds like they're just kind of all over the place, and you, you just got to get the binoculars out and look for them and find them, and hopefully you can cut them off. <laughs> yeah. Cutting them off is, is uh, that's a tough deal to do. Most things I tell people is just sit and, and sit. So that's the best thing to do is sit water. Because, I mean, out here in West Texas, we don't have a lot of water. So sit at water and, and just get comfortable and be there all day long. Because you're going to, when you get an access deer, you're going to earn him. He ain't just going to give it up. Right. Yeah, and if you do have water, they're going to come to water sooner or later. But you might have to sit there all day and go through a gallon of water yourself. Just just waiting for oh it. absolutely 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 but i mean that's that's one of the cool cool things about hunting out here is yeah you'll uh you'll you'll see a lot of different animals but you're gonna have to sit there all day long so but you'll see i mean you'll see everything we've got all dad we've got black buck we got neil guy we got bison there's i think last time we counted there's over 30 different species on this ranch so there's no telling what you're gonna see while you're sitting yeah. Now, so, whereabouts is your ranch located? Um, 
45 minutes south of San Angelo. Oh, okay. So just kind of on the edge of, of West Texas, the starting okay. edge of West Texas. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I, I had a, a, I also look at multifamily deals and I had a broker call me about a, a place in San Angelo. So I look mm -hmm. up to see where it's at and it's like, oh, okay, that's just South Abilene. That was yeah. an Air Force at Dice Air Force Base. And, you know, and there's oh, another there Air go. Force yep. base right there. So I was like, okay, I kind of know where's that. We just drive down to Odessa once in a while. And uh, we had some friends that we met down there. And uh, so I'm kind of somewhat familiar with it, but I kind of know the area now. And, and you know, right. that's that's some some nice area to have that much land and have that many. I'll tell you what, it grows, it grows good deer. It grows good deer. All this mesquite country out here, the mesquite beans, it grows really good deer out here. Yeah. Now, if somebody wanted to come down and book a hunt with you, how would they get a hold of you? Uh, Facebook is real good. Um, I've got Double S Adventures on Facebook. Also have Double S Ranch, or is this ranch specifically. Double S Adventures is the outfitting facet of my ranch or my business. That's where we book on a lot of other different ranches, but there or my website, huntwithdoubles.com or pick up the phone and call me. <laughs> 940 255 Great. Call me. <laughs> okay. What what I'll do for those uh, listening and watching, I'll put it, the links in the description of how to get a hold of that. Sure. And, and then I'll just have you message me the information and I'll just put it right in there. And that would makes it easier to connect in. And, uh, you know, after all, it's like, hey, you know, let's help each other out. And, you know, if you're thinking right. about going on a hunt, you, you know, what better way to, you know, get a hold of somebody that you know and, and you've talked to or mm -hmm. listened to. And, you know, of course, now, you know, not really match in person, but it's close when get to in person without me driving to Texas <laughs> or you driving to Nebraska, <laughs> yes, <sir>. you know. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but Why, you know, it's funny. I get a lot of hunters from, from, I got, just had a set of hunters come from Nebraska. I think it was three or four weeks ago, came down here and they've hunted, hunted with me for three years. That's all they do is bow hunt. They will not pick up a rifle. They apparently y'all don't have feral hogs up there, which we have no shortage of them down here. And everybody wants to come down here and shoot shoot feral hogs. Come on, yeah. we got plenty. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I did that many many years ago. Um, a friend of mine, you know, he, he every couple of years he goes on a big hunt, and and we went down to um, I think it's Catula, Texas, on a hog hunt. <laughs> and and I said, okay, I was born I, in Catula, Texas. <laughs> and, I was born down and, there. Oh yeah. <laughs> so went down there and yeah. uh, I was like, okay, I want to shoot him with a bow. They mm -hmm. didn't get that message. So they put us in a blind that you shoot a rifle out of. So mm -hmm. I'm basically standing in the doorway. I got my safety strap on so I don't fall out. I got it fastened with something in there. And I'm basically standing in the doorway, um, you know, waiting for one and nothing come by. And then it's getting kind of late over the, the last days and guys with, he'd, he'd shot one and so we just the last day, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to grab the rifle, used his rifle, and uh, um, a couple have lean had come by, and and I shot one, and he was videoing on an, on an old VCR video recorder. And at the time, I had a VCR player that I could do frame advance. So I wanted to see where I, I hit, because the first one I missed, I don't know how. Well, not be playing, it's <laughs> gone for one, probably. But, so I wanted to see where it hit. So I'm framing advance, and I actually caught the bullet on one of the frames on a VCR camera. Mm -hmm. I was like, cool. I did that. Uh, God, I can't remember the name of that hunting show we did. The Oath or something like that. And we were shooting a big call bug. And same deal. We caught the bullet mid-flight. You could see it just about impact the deer. Same deal. Now, I've only, at all the deer we've hunted, that's the only one I've ever seen that with on a rifle. I mean, you catch those Luminox all the time with archery stuff. Right. It's all mine are guided. So I'll have my guides film everything. And I love to slow-mo and watch that impact. It tells you so much about everything. I mean, you Oh, yeah. After seeing, I don't know how many deer harvested, when I see that Luminox, I can tell you within probably 30 yards of where that deer's going to be. But, I mean, because they all react similar you know they're all, all going right. to go to the same kind of place same general areas um but yeah i can tell within 30 yards watching that luminox hit that deer but pigs yeah, is a little bit different deal pigs yeah, is a crapshoot 
you you kind of you kind of know about where you hit and you know if it's a good hit or right. a bad hit or marginal hit um you know yeah. marginal hit you're gonna you're gonna be tracking them for a while and a good hit you oh, still yeah. may track them for a while but well uh, yeah, yeah. And, I, and now that doesn't count for the deer that are still up on their feet that we got to track and track and track but a good solid <laughs> hit i can tell you where he's going to be yeah but, well and that's just the experience now, it, you have <laughs> oh yeah yeah pigs is a little bit different story they they don't play by the same rules. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah, it, it's it, it's kind of interesting, you know, that it was it was a nice interesting hunt when I went down there and and then um of course then did, I went did on you eat that Lena? Oh yeah. Yeah, I Oof. nothing. It, it tastes like pork. <laughs> really? Yeah, God, I, I can't. It I can't again, when I can't get, I can't get past the smell of them. Oh, I I didn't notice anything. I just we just cut it up and and ate it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if you know how to skin them and you can get that meat or that they've got a big scent gland in the middle of their back, and if you can get around that and get it off where it doesn't touch the meat, it won't stink. But if you accidentally oh. nick that scent gland just a little bit. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. It smells like a skunk. Yeah. <laughs> it's awful. Yeah, I but I, I guess we never hit it because I I didn't smell it. The guys at the ranch were, you know, helping us on because we'd never cleaned the javelina, sure. so, you know, and hogs. So they we didn't really know exactly, you know, what to do, but um, you know, basically you just yeah. do like you do any other animal, but I I think the last javelina I shot was down in Cthulhu also. We were down there hunting whitetail, and I'd, uh, I'd shot the whitetail that I came down there to hunt, and uh, javelina came in, big boar. And I hadn't shot one since I was a kid. I say big boar. I mean a big one, 75 pounds. But I shot him, and he's mounted. I got him over at the lodge. They're, they're neat, neat animals. Yeah. Well, but they're kind of on the decline a little bit, and I think it's because of the feral pigs. You don't see them as much as you used to when i was a kid and uh they're just not around the the hogs i don't are, know what i don't know what's hogs called. are taking all, all the, the hogs, are, the hogs are messing everything down here yeah they're tearing up everything yeah but go, go, go down and uh, here, here's the deal you, you, you get a white tail hunt but you get two two boars with it <laughs> i shoot every yeah. one of them the white tail and two pigs you shoot your you shoot yeah. your deer and you get you get two pigs and go after after that. <laughs> right on. Yeah, we we shoot a lot of pigs, a lot of pigs. But I don't have it in me to drive past one when I'm driving around on the ranch. It's light them up when you see them. But then we run dogs and everything else. So yeah, we we try to keep them under control, but you can't. I mean, you figure they're they start breeding when they're six months old. They're going to have a litter of roughly 10, and they're going to have three litters a year, two to three litters a year. I mean, they just – you can't keep up with that. And no natural predators. Yeah, but, you know, one one hog, that's – that's I see that as, uh, you know, 30, you know, 30 little piglets, you know, every year out of each, each sow. And, and, you know, even if yeah. you have 50% mortality rate, that's still 15 more <laughs> Which you don't. for the next year. Which, yeah, you don't. Know, I was talking to a biologist the other day about him. And he said, you know, on them pigs, you can shoot the sow. And if her pigs are three days old, they can survive without her at three days old. Oh, there. <laughs> it's insane. It is insane. But I don't know. I don't know how to get them under control. Keep hunting. Yeah. 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 Free, free hunts for hogs. <laughs> that's it that's come, it come, Keep on. come down and hunt all the hogs you want <laughs> yeah yeah uh, that'd be one way of doing it <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah i don't know we can get enough people down here to do it <laughs> so yeah just just sit there and target practice you know yeah. take your bow down and shoot them or even you know hey some of us shoot rifles <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know we do a lot um, of bow hunts to pick. I, yeah. that's the way i like to hunt them. hunt over water with archery equipment hunting them with a rifle that just there's no challenge in that you know oh no because that, that i mean pigs really can't see well 
they don't hear well, but their nose is hard to beat. And to get in, get in on a pig, especially an older pig, within archery, within bow range, 20, 30 yards, and I like to shoot a recurve to get in 15, 10 to 15 yards, is near oh, impossible. Yeah. They're, it's hard to do. And I mean, me, I, don't get me wrong, I love my compound bow. I love, I, I've been shooting bear bows for, since I was 15, you know. Um, I like, I got where I was competitively shooting and shooting out there good ways. And I got into reed curves, and that's that's what got me. That's what really got me was the reed curves. I that's if I'm gonna go hunt for me anymore, I'm taking the reed curve. So and, and, you know, and hunting heard, pigs with a reed curve, that's that's where it's at. Yeah, I, I heard that a lot. A lot of compound shooters, you know, picked up the reed curve and 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 just decided, you know, that's what they wanted to do. And and yep, you know, it's it, it definitely takes a lot of practice to get good at it oh my god it, it takes so much practice it's not even funny like i hadn't shot in probably i don't know two months something like that and i'm afraid of pulling it back out how rusty i'm gonna be but <laughs> getting ready for deer season i hadn't had time to practice and i know i'm gonna be rusty but that's that's my i don't know stress relief time that's my therapy is get out there in the evenings and sling arrows. That's that's what I do. So running that, you probably don't get as much chance to go out and hunt as you you normally would if you wasn't running the ranch. For me, I don't I don't hunt a whole lot anymore. I don't get a chance to, um, but I take out a lot of hunters. I mean, I we hunt probably three hundred days a year out here. So I got a group that left yesterday and I've got another group, big group, two groups showing up tomorrow. So yeah, I don't, I don't get a chance to sit as much as I'd like, but. That's kind of the, the common theme. Uh, you know, I've talked to a couple other ones that, you know, start up an outfitting uh, business and, mm -hmm. you know, they, they hunt a lot and then they get the business and they don't get a chance to, to do as much hunting as, as they'd like to. But you know, right? Hey, you're, you're, we're still in the archery world. That's you know, that's what, what counts. And you know, sometimes taking, right. you know, taking that person out that hasn't really done much in archery and then seeing them, you know, kill their first first uh, uh, deer or whatever animal it is or hunt. That's exactly what know. I was going to say. That taking those guys out that have, girls. I tell you what, I like more than anything. If I can make a living doing just that, taking out kids to get their first one. I get more out of that than than I do harvesting one. I mean, I've I've harvested a lot of animals. I mean, a lot of animals, personally. But taking somebody out and and seeing reliving the excitement through them to me is more rewarding. I love it. That's what I got into this business for, you know. And uh, you know, sitting there and, and talking about you know when you get it, somebody out there on their first deer with a bow, I sit there and I talk about that first doe I killed, and I. I tell you what, that first year, I could have won the Super Bowl. I was more pumped. I've never been more pumped about anything in my life than harvesting that first doe. I mean, she was it, – it, I'll, I'll never forget it. I couldn't even get down out of the tree. I had to sit there for 30 minutes watching. I mean, she was down, knew she was down, and I couldn't get out of the tree. And so, of course, we don't have no big trees out here. I had to only go down about six feet, but I couldn't get down. So – yeah, that was kind of it for me after that. And then yeah, I get, I you know, when I see these guys come out here and they get their first deer with a bow, I get to relive that moment with them. You know, I get to see, I get to go back to that moment in time for me. And it's, it makes it worth doing. Yeah, that, that makes, makes it really nice. You know, I know when you take somebody out and, and, and they get the first deer or something like that, you know, it's, you know, mm -hmm. my, my one son, I took him out and, and, there was this deer walking by and so I didn't go out with him but he so he kind of stalked up to it and you know being new he didn't realize that what is behind the tree to draw so it got out where mm -hmm. he he could see it and it could see him and he couldn't draw because he hadn't drawn he didn't know that you know hey well while they're still behind the tree you got to draw and hold until they step out right and you know but that was that was kind of exciting and watching him you know sneak up you know on on that and uh, you know that that's always interesting. We do that, and uh, I, I know one one time was walking out. It was it was 
it was raining. It was supposed to quit raining. So we went out anyway. Uh, my son and I and, and my hunting partner, uh, we went out. It was supposed to quit raining, and it didn't quit raining. It was still raining. Now it wasn't raining really hard, but it was just a, you know, a, a bad enough rain that you didn't want to stay in it all day if you weren't seeing anything. So we finally decided, okay, it's it's like nine o'clock or something. It was supposed to quit, you know, two hours ago. So we decided to get down and go, and we're walking out. My son and I are walking, and here comes this doe, um, probably 20 yards in front of us. And we weren't really ready to go. And so I stopped, and I told my son, I said, Chris, get ready, you know, because I'm kind of blind. They're looking at me, and I can't see what he's doing behind. Mm -hmm. So get ready so you can, you can, you know, get your bow ready. And then, you know, just kind of step off to the side a little bit and go ahead and, and shoot it. But it didn't wait long enough for him to get ready. But, you know, that's, oh. you know, that, that was one of those is like, okay, um, you know, that was something that we hadn't really planned on. It, it, we hadn't seen anything on, in the rain all day long until we walk out. <laughs> and then, of course, that's when you're going to see him. Yeah. Every time. Every time. Here, yeah. Just... <laughs> Just well, like that, when I was going pheasant hunting all the time, you know, you're walking the field, you don't see any birds, don't see any birds. And I was like, you're, you're 20 yards from the end of the field and there's the fence and then the road or something. And you're just like, oh, okay. All of a sudden that last 20 feet or so, all the birds get up and you're not ready because you first, <laughs> okay, I walked, I, I walked for a mile in this field and I had no birds and then I'll get up right at the last, last second. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's like them deer coming in right at dark. You know, they'll be there on camera when you're not sitting in the stand. They'll be there on camera every day as soon as the feeder goes off because we run feeders here in Texas. And then you go sit in that stand and you don't see anything till yeah. right at dark or, you know, at all. I had a buck that I was hunting. Oh, I started this business. So it's probably five years ago. And uh, sorry, my phone keeps going off. Uh, probably five years ago, I'd had this big old, probably five-year-old eight-pointer pattern. And uh, I remember I was really excited. I had opening week in the archery season off. I didn't have nobody booked. So I was all excited. I told my wife, I said, I'm going to go sit in the blind. I'm going to get him. He's going to be in at this time. Be ready for me to get a, for me to call and say, I got him. I pulled in and I, I thought I had him pattern coming from the same direction, moving the same way on time every day until opening morning when I get in there, he shows up from the wrong direction, a hundred yards upwind of me, picks his head out, looks at me. I saw him for a brief second and he walked off. I hunted that deer for, uh, I think on, so we start roughly the first of October out here. I took a shot. I say I took a shot. I didn't really take a shot at the deer. My arrow, my release slipped as I was about three quarters on and I launched an arrow over his back I don't know 30 feet something like that I've been sitting there I finally figured out how to get to this buck I came in way out and around I figured I was blowing him out of his bed every day so I went out way out and around got up in the blind he came in like he was supposed to I'm sitting down I see him come in and I put my blind or my my tree stand on the back side of the tree it's just like what you're saying so I get drawn and peek around and take my shot um so everything was going good. I had him in. He kind of hung up at 30 yards. I said, well, well, we'll go ahead and send it. So I'm getting I'm getting just about three quarters drawn, and that release slips and launches that arrow over the top of his back, and I sit down, and I'm just disgusted because I've been hunting him for two weeks nonstop. <laughs> and my, my ex-wife calls me and starts jumping my butt about something, and <laughs> I'm on the phone with her, and this is like two minutes after I shot. And finally, I got mad, and I through that phone, I still ain't found my phone. <laughs> I was disgusted, and I never saw that deer again. Never saw him again. But I did find his sheds. He made it through the year, but I don't know what happened. I hadn't been, I hadn't hunted that place since. But yeah, I was, I was pretty upset about that one. Yeah, that would but, be when you miss it that much because of something like that. I, I know I had one oh, shot. Some I shot at a deer that failure, was. Just, yeah, mechanical failure over something that, you know, I say could have been prevented. If I would have double checked it one more time, it would have been a totally different outcome. Yeah. But I didn't. Yeah. You, so it's not good when you have mechanical failure. I know I had a release one time that broke. 
and oh. I, I was about half draw and I was at an indoor range um, at the club I was at and you know I always lean a little bit forward point it to the target and draw straight back as I lean as, you know straighten up a little bit so I'm always pointing at the target well about halfway through the release broke and ended up setting that arrow through the ductwork up in the ceiling and you know I'm shooting aluminum 25 12 so there's like you know, this this quarter inch hole in this ductwork, mm -hmm. and you know the the head of the release broke off. Well, and looking mm -hmm. at it was wrong. Is when they designed it, they they ground a knob and they got narrow and they got a little bit bigger, so that you'd screw doing the back of it, and that's what it held on. And it was so thin it couldn't handle the aluminum wasn't strong enough to be shot out of a seventy pound bow, and. Um. You know, and it broke. The head just broke. We found the the head about twenty yards down range because we were shooting at thirty <laughs> yards at that time. So, you know, the head went launched clear down down the range. And, and the the weird part is is uh, the brand of the release was fail safe. Oh, that was man. the name on the side of the release. They're already telling you it's failing. <laughs> And it did safely fail because <laughs> it did, I didn't get hit by it. <laughs> so it lived up to its name. Oh, yeah. man. So no, I, I use either Scott's or Carter's is what I normally use on my, my um, all my releases are either Scott. My, I do have a Carter handheld that I use when I hunt. Yeah. Um, I, it, it'll lock onto the loop. So I just let it hang off my mm -hmm. bow. And then right. I don't have to look at it to hook up. I can just put my hands on the string, go down to find the release, and I'm there. I can look at the deer the whole time or my target, what I'm looking at. I don't have to look at the release to grab it. And then my my wrist strap, which is a Scott, has a little hook on it that I hook around. Mm -hmm. So I can feel that hook. I can find the loop, and I can hook it up without looking at it. You know, those that right. have the jaws open up, you know, you almost have to look at them. You know, I guess if you got you do enough practice, you could, but yeah, and, and that's all those to me. I, I always the jaw type is the ones I always went with because I could lock my finger in behind that that trigger switch. And to me, at, well, let me rephrase that after that incident I had, I switched back to that jaw type just because it made me feel better and I didn't have any failures after that, yeah, but. Yeah. It made me feel better. I don't. I mean, you, you know, it's it's all what you get used to, right? It's, uh, you know, it's just all what you get used to, and that's what I shot forever, and that's why I enjoyed shooting is those those clamp type ones. Yeah, and, and I I don't, don't give me don't give me to tell type. you what brand it is because I couldn't tell you that in twenty years. It's the same <laughs> release I've been shooting for twenty years. Yeah. Well, but, my 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 Scott release I got from a, a guy. Uh, that was a rep for Scott releases mm -hmm. uh, back in the 90s and I still have it still use it that's the one I go to when it's really cold out you know because here in Nebraska mm -hmm. we can get some really cold days um, you know nothing nothing like your 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 cold days but we get really cold days up here and I don't want to grab right. the, the car to the handheld because I need to be able to feel the trigger and the and the, the web between my thumb and index finger and I need to have my fingers on the release so I know where it's at. So I don't have much of a glove. You know, it's one of those fingerless ones that's kind of all wore out. But just the back of my hand and my palm is about all that is, is covered still. And when it's, you know, below freezing, I don't want to grab that cold aluminum. So I go to my wrist strap because then I can, I can wear a glove. I just need the index finger exposed because that's all I need from there. Uh, so I go, that's my really cold weather release. And, you know. It doesn't matter what I never, would never even thought same. about a cold weather release. Oh, yeah. I never thought about a cold weather release. We, I mean, if we get below freezing out here for more than a couple of days, the state stops moving. <laughs> yeah. I, I was down, um, uh, let's, I'm trying to remember where that is. It's down in the south part of Texas by, um, um, oh, for some reason, I'm drawing a blank. It was in February uh, a couple of years ago. And there was snow and it was cold. And of course, I'm okay because I'm coming was, you know, February from Nebraska. So I have my winter coat. But people that were down there, and it was part of it was an outdoor event, which wasn't planned, you know, to be that cold. So got heaters up, people are freezing, and like uh this isn't cold to me. 
<laughs> we refer to that particular – I know exactly what February you're talking about. We refer to that as the apocalypse out here because we had, what, five days below zero? Uh, I went six days without power, eight days without water. Everything froze up. And uh, yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a rough one for us. Yeah. Yeah. That, that kind of was, was really tough down in Texas because you don't normally get that cold of weather, but. Um, we never get that cold of weather. I, I mean, I've lived, I'm 41 years old. I've lived here my whole life. I've never seen zero degrees in Texas ever. <laughs> I, when I was in Abilene um, one year, I think it was 75. We had snow Christmas Eve. Now it's gone by 10 o'clock next morning, but it's still Christmas Absolutely. Eve. It's like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got your white you Christmas. Know. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Christmas but, Eve, it snowed. And of course, you know, like I said, it's, it didn't snow that much and it didn't last past about 10 o'clock next day. But well, during, during that time, I hunted because, I mean, there was nothing else to do. We were sitting there freezing to death. So I was like, let's go hunting. You know, they're going to come to feed. Let's go. Right. And I, I was shocked at how easy it was to blood trail them in the snow i never even thought about that before i mean oh. ray charles could blood trail oh oh yeah it was great i i had one that i shot and the footprints in the snow wasn't anywhere close to the blood trail the blood trail was about two three two or three feet off to the one side it was squirting out that Arbor, much spray. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was just squirting out there, and and you know it's kind of nice in the snow because that that blood just just stands out on them on the snow. Absolutely, yeah. I thought I thought that was the coolest thing ever. I mean, we don't get to see that very often here, but to me that was mind blowing. It's like, how do you not find a deer with this? This is easy, but yeah, just probably, probably thought, footprints. Maybe that's how they do it up north. It's easy. But between that and the hoof prints, it, the spot and stalking, I mean, it was easy. We, we harvested a lot of deer that week, and uh, yeah, I had a good time. I'm, I'm all for doing that once a year. <laughs> yeah, get snow once a year, right? <laughs> yeah. Or, or just come up north. Well, we normally get in February. Here. We're done, we're done hunt, hunting whitetail at that point anyhow. But what, what we did see during that time is a lot of the axes are in Belva right then. And I had never seen it before. I'd go around, was driving around, and I'd see tines falling off everywhere. Well, we figured out it's frostbite, and those those tines, because the blood's on the outside of their antlers, they're growing. Right. Those velvet bucks, and their 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 tines were falling off everywhere. Their brow tines, everything was. I mean, main beams falling off. It was insane. I'd never seen anything like that before. I guess I hadn't thought about that because you know up here, by the time it gets cold, the deer have already dropped their everything's hard horn velvet anymore. Yeah. I don't know that anybody's ever really seen it. It was, that was, that was a definitely a different experience for just fr from my standpoint as a ranch owner, looking at the deer and you're seeing something you've never seen before. So I thought it was pretty cool. Th that's kind of why I we mean, do this, right? We get to see all kinds of yeah. stuff that people don't normally see. Yeah. Every day is different. You know, you never know what you're going to see, but, but yeah, I, I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah, that's uh, we you know we all have kind of stories you know that that are really cool. And um, what's what's your most memorable hunt you've been on? Who, me personally or guided hunt? Well, we let's let's do both of you personally and then and the guided hunt. <laughs> I got a couple stories that uh, that that doe that I talk about so much. My first archery doe. That one's. <laughs> that one's one that'll uh that'll go, go down um and since we're not being politically correct we're talking about Catula. um <laughs> we were down there bow hunting just south of Catula at a buddy of mine's place and um we were looking for one specific management deer and of course like i said you said we weren't being politically correct i'm gonna tell the whole story well okay. we're down there hunting having a good time drinking beer all day and uh, I'm sitting in the, we're, there's no trees down there to hang a tree stand in. So we're sitting in this pop-up, two of us, and I had to pee. So i am got the pop-up zipped up. I'm out the back. I still in the blind, but, you know, doing my business. 
And he hits me on the shoulder and he says, hey, that deer showed up 20 yards from us while I'm peeing right there and have to get out – or not get out, but turn around <laughs> and get a bow shot off. And, and I got him. But that was <laughs> – those two were probably my two favorite hunts. I mean, they were the that buck, he was a 145 inch white tail buck, and it was the whole thing was a comedy of errors. Like, it nothing about it should work. We were sitting in the wide open, we just put down that pop up that day. We went out there and dumped some corn on the ground, no feeders, no like it shouldn't work. We weren't even there trying to, we were trying to hunt, but we weren't trying to hunt, you know what I mean? We, yeah, <laughs> it was just one of those days we're just here having a time, and uh, we got him. That whitetail doe, though, she'll she'll go down as probably my all-time favorite harvest. Um, I mean, it was nothing. Um, when I got her, I, there was a little oak tree out in the middle of a field, and I saw these does walking back and forth there every day. So I started putting corn on the ground every day about the same time. And uh, she showed up just like clockwork. I mean, she, she came in when she was supposed to, and everything worked out perfectly. And uh, called my buddies, everybody. I mean – I shot her. I was screaming, hollering. It took me, like I said, probably 20 minutes before I get down out of the tree and uh, calling all my buddies, telling them, and I was just pumped, just pumped. Um, as far as my guided hunt, man, I've had some good ones. Um, the best one I've done, and it was a rifle hunt, this, uh, this group that I've done a lot of work with called Texas Hunt for the Cure, they, turk it, they take out kids that have uh, – terminal diseases or life-changing events happened to them and they sent me a little girl um she was four and a half years old the ranch that they normally took them to wouldn't take her because she was too young um she was four and a half when they sent her to me the first time and within about five minutes i mean i've got a daughter i've got a stepdaughter i got two adopted daughters and a daughter like i there's a lot of little girls on my side of the family you know what i mean <laughs> Yeah. So they sent me this little girl. Um, she had me wrapped around her finger within five minutes and she knew it. Uh, she had a disease called, I'm going to butcher it. It's, it's D I P G or D P I G. I forget, but it's basically an inoperable brain tumor. It's, it's a death sentence. Um, they gave her one to three years and all she wanted to do was she want like hunt for, um, uh, kind of like make a wish. All she wanted to do is go hunt. So said, come on. So she came out, um, she hunted a ram, and then in a year and a half later, we did another hunt with that same group and brought out two more kids. And they said, Hey, can we bring a third? I said, Absolutely. So they didn't tell me who the third was. Well, it was her again. And her, you know, when they bring everybody out, it's the family, siblings, everybody comes out and speak. Big to do. Yeah. And uh, we got her on a Got her on a second ram and she passed away. I think it was two months later. So that one, uh, that one goes down as one of my favorite. Well, then I started doing more with that group, and uh, we did the first an first annual memorial for her out here at the ranch where we brought out. I think it was three three kids. Yeah, three kids we brought out. And then I brought her parents and her little sister to come out and be representatives. And it's for them. We're going to do it every year. So that, uh, that one's probably my favorite. And it, that little girl was something special, you know. But uh, that, one, that one was my favorite guy to hunt of all time, was that little girl. Yeah, that, that, she was, that is she was, kind of nice. She was something else. Yeah, you know, that, that young was, uh, just wanted to hunt. <laughs> that's all she wanted her to do she didn't care about nothing else she could have had you know the the uh, uh disney world all that stuff that she just wanted to go home so <laughs> how do you say no to that no you know yeah definitely can't say no to something like that that's you know that, no. that's something that you know we like taking the kids out anyway and, and they have somebody that wants to hunt that bad and and you know and it's i mean for lack of better terms is her last wish that's what she wants to do right she, when she goes out there and she's like, what can I shoot? And I'm like, baby, shoot whatever you want. Let's have it. The ranch is yours today. I don't care. You know? And <laughs> she got her a nice little ram, about the only thing that would stand still for her. And she was just, she was on cloud nine. So that's what it's about for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that that's one, kind of nice. That, that, that one will go down as one of my all time favorite favorites. I don't think I can, I don't think anybody's ever going to talk that one. 
No, that that's that's hard to top. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've got the the DIPG uh, cancer ribbon tattooed on my, right here for her. So that's how much it meant to me. But yeah, that one's going to be a tough one to beat. Yeah, that one is. That that is definitely a a very interesting and and in, inspiring story you know they hear you know that young lady really wanted to go hunt and she was mm -hmm. able to do it you know for for two two years in a row been able to get out there and, and hunt. right yeah and her little sister's carrying up carrying on her legacy they're going to start a little uh a little non-profit deal taking other kids out that have similar issues and her little sister is ooh, i guess she's five now and uh when they came out on this last one she was talking to the kids. It was her deal. She was running it for her big sister. And you don't talk about choke up a grown man now. That was that was tough seeing that little baby out there talking about her sister and saying why she's doing all this. That was a that was a tough one. Yeah, that but that would be, but you know what what a inspirational, you know, child, you know, that was that she <laughs> she had enough uh, you know, wherewithal and knew what's going on to do that kind of stuff and you know, you, you don't expect that out of somebody, you know, you know, no, not even really out of kindergarten, hardly, you know? No, no. But I mean, she, she was born into a tough road. She, she had to do that. And she felt like that's what she needed to do to honor her sister. So she was doing it. I mean, I, she, she's tougher than I am. I couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Kids, kids are pretty tough sometimes. You never know what they're going to do. Yeah. Yeah, that was a that was a good one. That was a good one. Yeah, and we're gonna do a lot more of those. That's what it's all about. I love I, if I can make a living just hunting with kids. That's all we do. That's all we do. Yeah, that that would be good if you could you know do that. But you know that's you know you can't just do that because you got to have some others coming in to get the money to pay for the ranch to be able to bring oh, the kids on it. And yeah. Yeah, but I mean, shoot, this is, you know, this is, this has been a dream of mine. Just, I mean, it's, it's everybody's dream. If you think about it, I mean, who doesn't want to hunt for a living? I, there's right. not a hunter in the world that wouldn't trade places for me to play trade places with me for in a second. You know what I mean? So it's, it's pretty spectacular when all I get, all, all I ever think about, all I ever talk about is deer hunting. That's all that's ever on my mind. First thing I do when I wake up every single morning is look at cameras. That's the last thing I do every single night is look at cameras. That just, yeah. you know, I it, it's not even a passion anymore. It's just what you, it's just what you wake up and you do. You know what I mean? It's just when you go to bed, that's just what you do. You're thinking about it nonstop, thinking about these deer, watching them. And I tell you, my favorite time of year is springtime. There ain't nothing more than I love early summer and seeing those fawns hit the ground. That, to me, is what makes everything worth it. Is seeing those babies. I love seeing the big bucks. Don't get me wrong, but seeing those fawns, there's something about those fawns that just gets me pumped up every year. Well, so. when you see a lot of fawns, you, you know that the the herd is maintaining or growing. It's yeah. healthy and growing, and just right. I mean, I don't care who you are, how big and tough and strong you are. You see a fawn, you got to stop and look at it. There's just something about that new life that just it just gets yeah. people excited. It gets me excited. I don't know about everybody else, but it gets me excited. I know I, you know, I, I'd hunted for a few years and a friend of mine, we went over to uh, uh, a little, little um, creek that fed into a, you know, a little bit of a, a lake and we're going up and, and we see this fawn was, had probably fallen into the water and was up out of the water on the bank, but there was no way to actually get back up where the mother was at. Mm -hmm. So we go up with fish, we come back and it's still there when we got back. So we pull up to the boat. I take the front and I've got a towel in there. So I grab the, the fawn and I figure it's just going to, you know, just start kicking or fighting. But, you know, I just kind of let out a little, little, little bellow. And then I set it down and, and I put the towel over its head, kind of pat it until we found a place. We found a trail that would lead back up and we could hear the mom mm -hmm. walking around on top. So we put the fawn back on the ground where the fawn could get back up where the mother was. And then we just left and 
you know, we didn't know, you know, like on sometimes a bird you handle them and the mothers will reject them. I didn't know on a deer or not. So I talked yeah. to one of the game wardens like, yeah, that, that no big deal. Um, and it was the, the next hunting season I killed my first deer. Mm-hmm. You, you know, it's, and, and that was, that's a different story in itself because I was, uh, where I was at, it was public land, but there was a trail and there was a bunch of bushes where the trail was. So I had to get above the bushes. So I had to get the tree stand up about 20 feet up in the air. So I'm putting in pegs and get up there and, and, and I'm, I'm up there almost on the top. And I see this, this couple and this kid come walking through. They basically walk underneath my tree. Don't even know I was there. I wasn't in camo. I was in blue jeans and, and, and a t-shirt. Cause it was, you know, early season. It wasn't the hunting season yet. You know, there September 15th is when our season started at that time. So I'm up there and they walk past there and they get down, down where Randy's at and they see him, you know, or he sees, he sees, they see each other down there, but right past the demon was there. So I finally got my tree standing in and here comes this deer. And it's a, it was a buck, a small, small basket one, but you know, my first year, I don't care. I'm first of all, I'm going to take a shot. I'm going to shoot it, you know, and mm-hmm. I'm shooting 52 pounds. Uh, a big, heavy, I think it was, I think that time, a 2117 arrow with 145 grain tip on it. And I shot. <laughs> and when that deer turned around, I've got about almost three feet of arrow sticking out the other side of the deer. I think the fletching stopped it from exiting the deer. And it run through the, the tall grass. And, and you know, I'm trying, the first time I experienced tracking, so I wanted to track it. We kind of knew where it went. In fact, Randy went up and they actually found it. And I said, I'm still going to track it. You know, he knows where it's at, but I want to track it to find it because I'd never really tracked before. First deer I shot. Right. So I tracked it and, and you know, I, we, we come up to it and, you know, I got a little better tracking after that. But, uh, you know, the, the, yeah. the first deer, I was 20 feet up and they were in his 40 yard shot. And I sent that arrow up 52 pounds clean through the deer just about. <laughs> yeah, I've seen them. I've seen them hang up like that. But a 40 yard shot on a white tail is a heck of a shot. That's a, I don't know that I've ever shot one that far. Not a white yeah. tail. That, that's the longest I've shot. Um, I've shot them a few at 20, not yeah. many. I set up for a 20 yard shot, but those darn deer, they won't stay that far away. They always come in closer. I've had them walking five really? feet from my tree stand. Uh, I've shot more of them at 10 yards than I have at, at 20 yards or longer. Um, wow. You know, they, they, they're just... Well, y'all have got trees that you can get into. Our trees aren't that tall out here, so getting getting them that close is hard. That uh, that spot that I was telling you about when I, where I shot my first doe, after I killed her, I started playing. I said, you know, because I was hand feeding out there every day. I didn't have a feed or nothing set up. So I'd go out there with a bucket of corn and dump a little corn out of every day. So I started seeing how close I could feed them up to that tree. And like I said, I was six, maybe eight feet off the ground, just in a crook of an oak tree. And uh, I started getting them in about five to seven yards somewhere in there. I thought, well, I'm going to shoot one. Well, then I didn't think about being five to seven yards away and only being eight feet off the ground. You can't get drawn in a little oak tree <laughs> in South Texas or in, in Texas. There is, I mean, you move a muscle and they're looking at you. Well, I didn't know. I was just playing around. Being, I mean, I said I was 25 years old, just being a kid, just jacking around. I learned a lot that year. <laughs> I learned a lot that year about how to how to hunt deer with a bow. But yeah, distance is your favorite or is, is your friend in Texas. So yeah, yeah, take yeah I won't hardly shots. <laughs> I won't. I won't never get them within 20 yards. 20 to 30 is about where I like. I like them be. I don't like to shoot over 30 on a whitetail. They jump that string way too fast. But but yeah, that's where I twenty to thirty is where I like to be here. Yeah, and and I try, like I said, I try to set up for twenty yard shots because I prefer that twenty yard shot. Um, right. You know, until they get really close, I don't have to worry about you know difference in my pin. You know, ten yards mm-hmm. or twenty yards, I, I maybe an inch difference on in impact. Uh, but now I start getting into the five feet. Now then, that's a completely different story. You know, now that 20 yard pin, you completely missed it low. You know, so I've never um, shot anything that close. <laughs> yeah, you, you had to try it sometime. Uh, set up a target, you know, plenty big enough. Just take a regular target and put a single spot or five spot, whatever, and stand five feet away from it and put your 20 yard pin 
on the X and shoot. And you're going to see you're probably about three inches low. Really? Yep. Think, think about oh. it. Now, I've talked about this in other times, too. Your, your eye is your peep. Your sights are your right. eye level. Where's the arrow? That's true. The arrow's down by a corner of your mouth. And what's the difference between your eye and your mouth? Right. Probably about three inches. Right. So the arrow is leaving the bow three inches low. And at five feet, you don't have time to raise up to where your 20-yard pin is. Yeah, that makes sense. That's why I people never shoot through blinds. That. I don't ever shoot that close. What's that? Th that? That's why people shoot through their blinds. Because yeah. they don't realize the arrow is way below where the side. Oh, I had to pay right on it. Well, you need to look because the arrow is about three inches lower. And when you shoot, if you're not at least three inches above, so sitting oh, yeah. in a blind, if you don't sit up or have yourself up high enough, you're going to shoot through the wrong part of the blind. You know, a lot of well, men shoot through that shit a bit. Yeah, they, they shoot through my pop-ups all the time. I mean, I've had them shoot through my box stands with rifles. The same deal, just that diff difference in the scope versus the barrel. But, yeah, oh, I, mean, yeah. I, I've, I've, I didn't even <laughs> – I, I never would have even thought about shooting at five foot on anything because we just – they don't get that close out here. Right, yeah. I know some of the 3D tournaments, they'll put targets up really, really close because it messes with a lot of people because they don't know how to yeah. shoot them. And right. uh, lots of times, so, so I'll, I've had guys say, well, I'll just sight down the arrow. Have you ever done that before? Well, no, I'll just sight down the arrow. Well, you're not, okay, not going to do very good. No, that, that don't work. You got to practice it. And, and I had right. a, uh, I was at a 3D tournament indoor. We got a, we got a platform we're standing on. And five feet in front of the platform is a gator. And I knew on my bow, that was set up, five feet is 70-yard pin. I shoot it for 70 yards. So I draw up, and I'm leaning down, bending down, bending down, and leaning against the rail. Good thing the rail didn't break because I'd have fell on the ground. And I got my 70-yard pin there, and I went ahead and fired, and I nailed it. Because I knew the that the 70-yard pin. 70 yard pin at five feet. Huh. You'll, you'll have to. Interesting. You'll have to. You'll have to I'm going to do that tomorrow. I'm going to yeah, figure it out tomorrow. tomorrow. First thing. Yeah, yeah. Let me know how far you seem like you're off because, you know, that would be, that definitely be a challenge. And then we just go, you know, five feet, 10 feet, you know, now, now you're at five yards. What is it at yeah. five yards as opposed to 20 yards? So, even set one up at five yards and, and shoot at with your 20 yard pin and see where it hits. Be yeah, I don't think I've ever you're taken a shot. Yeah, I, I bet a lot. I, I don't think I've ever taken a shot under 10 yards. Well, that's cutting that in half and you're cutting in half two or three more times. Yeah, that right. hits off a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going I'm to try that tomorrow. I'm going to call you and be like, <laughs> all right, now I get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll have to. Uh, post in the group how far you was off. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Lord. Uh, I'll, I'll expect a post in the group tomorrow. <laughs> it's like okay. Yeah. Oh, this is this is right. I hey, get it this now. Right here. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So I used to you do know, that a lot with my recurve at five and ten yards, but with no sights, you don't really know. You know, it's all it's all reactive shooting to me. Like I never had anybody teach me how to do it. I just picked it up and started sling arrows. And. Uh, you know, that, that 10 to 15 yards, that was always kind of my sweet spot. But I would try some closer, and I, I never was any good at that. But 10 to 15 yards, I could, I could really do pretty good at that. But, but there again, you don't have any, you don't have any baseline right. like you do on a re or like you do on a compound. Well, and there's different yeah, I, techniques. I, I instinctively, I look at the target, and I draw back, and I shoot. You know, I don't reference right. off the bow or, or, or the tip of the arrow or nothing. Uh, if I'm going to start referencing, you know, for me, my, my, is, I'm going to put a sight on it. If I'm going to start referencing off anything, because you draw back, you know, if you're doing off the tip, did you draw exactly the same this time? Or did you draw a quarter inch further or a quarter inch less, which puts less power, more power yeah. in it. And then it's, it's off. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of them that, you know, do the gap shooting and, and the string walking. And, um, you know, I finally figured out what string walking was uh, the first time I, I seen um, 
uh, Jake Comiskey, um, he's an Olympic archer. And, you know, he says, you know, string, string walker. And I was like, and I've been watching the, the, um, the Skinwalker Ranch on, on TV. And I'm thinking, yeah. okay, is a string walker like a skinwalker? I, I, I had no idea. So I right. tried to figure it out. And finally, I actually talked to a guy uh, on one of the podcasts that does that and explain now what's going on. It's like, oh, okay. So basically what you're doing is depending on where you put your hand, your hand all the way up against the, the, the arrow will be at your far distance. Now, as you get closer and closer, you're going to move your hand down further and further down your string. So what it does is it moves the arrow up a little higher and it, it's going to shoot you know, lower. So you walk up and down wow. the string. Where you put your hand is where it's going to change where it impacts. And you know that, that's a whole science in itself that you know, I, yeah, I don't shoot enough recurves to you know, to even worry about trying to practice it. But um, you know, if I was to shoot well, the recurve. That's me. And get... I never had anybody teach me. I never had anybody show me any tricks, nothing. I just bought I said, you know what? I want to shoot recurve. So I went and bought one. Didn't know what I was doing. Just started slinging arrows, and that's I. As far as form, it's probably completely wrong, but I can hit, and I'm having fun. So, what else matters? Yeah, yeah. As long as you're not flinging them, hitting deer in the butt and, and the neck and animals, and not not killing no, them. No, God, no. Um, you know. Man, that that's that's one thing that bothers me so much that I see in my world is I see a lot of archers that call themselves archers that come out and they shoot two or three times a year. And then they come out here and everybody's good to 40 yards, everybody. But most of them don't really know what 40 yards looks like from what I've seen. 25 is kind of what they're calling 40. And uh, it, it, that bothers me, you know, exactly what you're yeah. saying, slinging arrows, hitting deer in the butt and in the neck. And man, <laughs> You've got to practice. You have to be efficient to be able to dispatch a deer properly and ethically. You have to practice and shooting three times before opening weekend doesn't that's not practicing in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, I, I know. I was, um, when I was down at PSC down to dealer school because I was a PSC dealer for a while, uh, they was telling the story that what they did is they had a group of people come in, some guys and ladies come in, and they had what we call up here a bionite deer, it's a steel plate shaped like a deer with the lungs cut out so mm -hmm. if you make a good shot you get your arrow if you make a bad shot you're going to destroy your arrow because you're going to hit that steel plate and arrows don't stand up the steel plates right. very well and i right. had them all and this is okay how far do you think you can hit that you know you got to make a shot where do you think you go and, and it was, it was kind of weird it's like all the guys so oh, i can do this at 40 shoot smack you know, wreck their arrow, wreck their arrow. And it's the, the one lady got up there. It's like, you know, I'm not comfortable. I, I got to get up to 20 yards. So she got up 20 yards and, and she got to keep her arrow. You know, so right. you got to know your distance. How how good are you in a judging yardage? And that's one of the things that, uh, you know, you could have a course set up. It's like, okay, here's where you start. How far do you think this is? Shoot it. And, mm -hmm. and if you miss, it's like, well, you can't shoot that distance until you can hit consistently. And right, I, I think a, a scoring for a 3D target setup that you would have down there, it'd be scored minus five, eight, and 10. Yep. The lungs are eight, and then your, your vital hearts are a 10. The center is a 10. Mm -hmm. Any body shot is minus five. I like that. Because that's, that's a wounded deer. <laughs> you could actually end well, up when you'll never find. zero or below <laughs> yeah that, you know? yeah and, yeah i mean a lot of times that's a deer you'll never find right that's a deer you'll never find you know it, if you're lucky you'll you'll catch an artery in the back hip i did that once i was i didn't realize it but my right eye was getting blurry and i see two sets of pins and the bright set of pins has always been a right eye. My left eye, just over the years, I just come, my, I, my brain didn't even pick up the left eye pins. Well, as the right eye got blurry, my left eye is, is my clear eye now. Well, I drew, I hunt with both eyes open. So I see both of them. I just ignore the dim set of pins. I drew back. I put that pin right where it was supposed to, right, right behind that, that front shoulder, right in the vitals, and I shot. 
and we tracked it and I ended up hitting it in the back hip, hitting an artery. So he still got it, but I hit it in the back hip and I'm thinking, what's going on? You know, I, I didn't realize at the time that my mind is going to pick up my left eye pins, not my right eye pins, because now left eye's clear, right eye's blurry. So I went down to the mm. range and I always practice with my left eye close. So I, I shoot, nailed it right where it's supposed to be. Open it up and I'm shooting a five spot. I'm shooting the upper right hand spot. I missed the target to the left at 20 yards. Oh, I didn't wow. even hit the paper. And I was like, what's going Ooh. on? So then I close my eye and open up. It's like, oh, okay. I have a blurry eye. Then now I'm, I'm still right eye dominant, but my left eye is the one that's going to pick up the pins. So then when I was going out hunting, I'm blinking my left eye to force me to pick up the right pins. And then I always wear right. a baseball cap. And I don't have one on tonight, but I always wear a baseball cap when I, when I hunt. And then I have my hooded sweatshirt. And I found one time I turned my head, the hood blocked my left eye. Problem solved. I don't have to worry about it because as I turn my head, my left eye is blocked by the, the hood of the, the sweatshirt. Oh, and now my right eye picks it up. That's it. Oh. That's that's crazy. You know, but you learn more from those bad shots than you do anything else. You know, like you said, right. you, that you made a bad shot, you went and figured out what it does. That's where you learn. You don't ever learn nothing on the good shots. So I had one that haunted me for, and I hung my bow up for two years because of it. But uh, I was sitting in a in a pop up. And I was hunting some does. This lady let me come hunt out there. She had 15, 20 acres. So just shoot whatever you want. And it was it was Christmas Eve. I'll never forget it because my daughter was at home with my wife. And uh, her ex was there having Christmas with the kids and his girlfriend. So my Christmas Eve, my wife is having Christmas with my daughter and her ex-husband and the kids at my house because I was out trapped. <laughs> tracking it here till midnight but this doe she came in about 25 yards and she she kept giving me a she was quartering to me pretty hard and I knew I shouldn't have taken the shot I knew it I said no I think I can slip that in and I kind of took a shot right here and clipped one lung and she ran for uh, probably two miles after the time by the time I quit tracking her ran out of blood but just you know I knew I shouldn't have taken that shot but I thought ah man that that stuff happens to everybody else i can make this shot and i mean i'm sure i killed her i just never found her and that that hunt i mean i literally hung my boat for two years because of that shot didn't pull it out just because i was disgusted with myself but ever since then i've been a whole, whole lot more um i don't want to say cautious but cautious of the shots i take and it's not it's it's a lot a lot more than cautious. Like I'm adamant we are taking these shots and only these shots. Broadside or quarter and away, I will not take a quarter and two me shot. That arrow hits and it goes to deflect back just a little bit and you're chasing the deer. I'm not doing it anymore. Not doing it. Me personally. That that one doe wrecked me of taking a, a marginal shot. Well, but that's a good thing. You know, those one of those marginal shots is what you know, gets, you know, coyote food, you know, that, yeah. you know, we don't get to eat it, the coyotes do. And, and that'll you know, keep me like, up at night. No, when I killed one that I couldn't find, that'll keep me up at night. It bothers me. But I, I mean, that, that goes right back to the profession I can't, I got myself into. I did it because yes, I enjoy hunting, but I love deer. I love seeing deer. And to right. know that I killed one or wounded one and it went to waste that it keeps me literally keeps me up at night yeah yeah we you know we've all lost deer before that you know we we hit mm -hmm. and you know we couldn't find we're tracking and tracking and we couldn't find and couldn't find and you know there's no blood trail and then and then you're just kind of walking around in circles trying to find them and uh, and, and then and it happens enough with good shots you know it happens enough when everything is lined out perfect but then you put a marginal shot on top of that. It's just a bad day for everybody. Yeah, we, we had one. It was it was night and we're tracking and we're tracking and we're tracking. We're walking, we're walking. And 
and we're going around in you know circles and moving moving the direction it was going last and and finally it's like you know it, it must not have been as good a hit as we thought it was so we yeah. uh we called it next week we come back oh man what's that stinking about mm -hmm. 30 yards from where we stopped looking it was dead you know yeah yeah that that's why i actually prefer morning hunts because <laughs> you can mm -hmm. see a little bit better you can than keep going a little bit longer yeah 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 you, you you go so long it's like okay i i don't know where this is at you know we we track it and you know a lot of times we'll leave you know little little marker flags you know along the way so you can look back and see where's the trail where's it most likely going to go and you know because they don't normally take big turns uh, i have seen them no. do that though um, you know, just all of a sudden take a right hand turn and for no reason at all. And, That's pretty rare. Uh, That's pretty yeah. rare they do that. But you're talking about the flagging tape. I use glow sticks at night. Oh, when I'm yeah. trapping at night, I carry glow sticks in my bag. That way I can hook them on the trees and keep going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, those but, those are pretty nice too when, you, when you're trying to track something that goes that far at night. You know, yeah. good flashlights definitely help. Oh, for sure. Instead of your cell phone trying to walk around out there trying to get I've oh, done oh, that yeah. plenty of times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cell phone dies. I got a little uh little bitty mini mini mag. I, I'll carry two of them with me. And and those are almost kind of perfect because you get too much light, you can't see mm -hmm. the blood. You want to small right. thing. It, so it, it it in one spot. You know, so you're finding yeah. them, you know, and if we've tracked them down where they're, you know, the 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 size of a pea is bigger than the blood drops. Oh, for so, sure. And, and you know, you're tracking. It's like, okay, here's another 20 feet, another drop, another 20 feet, another drop. And and <laughs> if you don't flag it somehow, you're going to lose where that last one is at. And say, okay, I'm dripping here, dripping here. Then it, it's got to be up here and, and go look for it again. And one right. thing to remember is, do not walk on the trail that you're blood trailing on. Walk off to the side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because if you want, but that's you walk past one, you start walking. Yeah. Well, down here, well, we don't have a lot of leaves, oh, but oh, yeah. down here, uh, dogs do do a world of good. We, I'm a firm believer in tracking dogs. As I, like I said, I do not like having one wounded that we can't get. So we'll bring the dogs in and, and I, I'm not going to let them go to waste. I, I, I just don't have it in me. Not if I can help it. Well, and, and so, again, tracking dog, you're, you're not hunting with the dogs, but you're using the track no. after you killed them and, you know, or shot them. Correct. And I, I've never really and, checked Nebraska what law, their laws are in using tracking dogs. But I know other places, you know, they, they have people that have tracking dogs and you get one down, can't find it, call them up and, you know, they'll they'll help you track your track your deer. And So from what I've seen from, from archery hunters that, that come down here in, in Texas guys, generally speaking, um, my recovery rate on archery hunters is about 50% without a dog. 50% recovery rate is what, is what we're looking at on my commercial operation. With the dogs of that 50% that I wouldn't recover, it's gone up to 95%. Oh, that, that's so, definitely worth having the dogs. <laughs> 100 percent worth having the dogs so yeah i you can't function without the dogs so i mean it's we we call them in a lot a lot yeah but they're not it, hunting it, for us i mean it's not like a deer drive it's, it's just like what you said finding a wounded deer right. or a dead deer you know gut shot deer don't bleed so if you pull that arrow no. a little bit you, you're not going to find them till the next day when the buzzards find them Liver shots, I mean, liver shots will bleed a little bit, but they don't bleed a lot. And it's just little drops here and there, unless you find them where they're bed down and then you'll find a pool of blood. But other than that, they're, they're moving and they'll stay up for hours, hours. Right. Well, and last time too, you know, when you do get that bad shot, don't chase them because they're going to get up and run oh, yeah. the blood trail. Uh, I know one time I was, I was uh, hunting and it was up here in Nebraska in, um, December, I think, and, and it was predicting about three inches, three inches or so of snow later that night. Well, I got on my tree stand 
and this deer comes by and, and I shot it, ended up getting a, a bad shot on it. And so I sat there for a while and my hunting buddy come, I got down and found the first blood. And then I just kind of waited for him to show up, you know, a couple hours later and we're starting to track. And, you know, this is, you know, been probably three hours since I shot it and, and we're, we're tracking, tracking all of a sudden this deer gets up and runs off. Mm -hmm. So we go over where it was at. Okay. There's some blood pool down there. We're done. So we left, you know, walk straight out. So we knew where to come back to. So Randy and his son and I, we come back the next night, you know, cause I'd work and, um, so we're tracking and I tell him, we're looking for a lump of snow. You're not going to see a deer. It's covered with snow. Yeah. So we're walking around trying to find all these lumps. And I found it about 30 yards away. It bedded back down and it died. From where you jumped now, it? Yeah, from where I jumped it, it ran about 30 yards and, and laid back down. Wow. And, and, and because we just stopped, we didn't, we didn't walk any further down yeah. after it. It just got up and run and, and laid back down. And when we got there, now you got to remember this, it's got snow on it, but it got down into, well, it was below freezing or you wouldn't have snow. Uh, probably in the twenties. I think it was around in twenties. And we come back the next night, yeah. the legs were froze, but the inside body was still warm. He just, he just, that sounds like liver. Was it a liver shot? Uh, I don't remember where it was. I know it was a little too far back. <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, it, it was still warm. So, and of course, snow will insulate a little bit. But when it's that cold, yeah. um, you know, it laid down and it laid there for quite a while before it died and, and you know, was able to get it because we just let it, we let it lay. If we'd have kept going, yeah. we'd have never got it. Yeah. That, that to me sounds like a liver shot deer because they have a tendency of doing that. They'll go a little bit and then bed down and they go a little bit and bed down. Gut shot deer, they kind of, they move a little bit. Down here, you always find them closer to water. They, they're going to water, but they're they're traveling, generally speaking. Right. Those liver shot deer are like that bed down. And you just, it's just time. You just got to let them go. I mean, it, it, like you said, it set up overnight and all day and was still warm. I mean, I've seen them go 12 hours before you find them from a liver shot. So that yeah. makes a lot of sense, especially with a bow. They go a long time with a bow. Yeah, you, you don't you don't like doing that. And you know, that was the only one I shot while it was moving. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I wanted to do my tree stand by four o'clock because where I was at further down, they're getting there too late. So I moved up further. Yeah. And I guess some kids or something was up there and kicked it up because it wasn't walking, it was kind of trotting, you know, trying to move away from, right. from the people that were up there. Because of public property and and you know people move around all the time, and you know so you know I was like okay do I follow it take a spot and it's like uh, so I shot and then it just it was going faster than what I anticipated and you know made a bad shot but I still got it <laughs> you know right. it's not like well oh well forget it we'll come we, we well, won't worry about unfortunately y'all are cold enough and it didn't go to waste you know fortunately y'all are cold enough and it didn't go right. to waste so but there again like we talked about. You learn something from it. You you know made a mistake. You learn something from it. Move on. You know. Yep. It's a good day. Yeah. You found a deer and you learned something. Yeah. Yeah. Learn when it's going to snow. Don't make those bad shots because you're going to have to track them. They stay <laughs> on lumps of snow. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. I was surprised. I, I would have never found it. <laughs> I would have never even thought about you know looking for a lump of snow. I'd have been looking for a deer too. Well, if it had bedded down and you get three inches of snow, it's going to be covered with snow because everything was covered yeah. with snow. <laughs> yeah. But for somebody who doesn't know what three inches of snow looks like, generally speaking, it's, <laughs> I wouldn't have known. They would have never, <laughs> I'd have been looking for a deer laying on top of the snow. No, they, they, they'd be underneath the snow. <laughs> now, that's it, crazy. Even, even the live ones, you know, when it's snowing, they'll have snow all over them. You know, they don't get up and shake it oh. off. You know, it's knowing that they just kind of sit there and wait and, you know, and save their energy. So with that much snow, there's not really no food. Yeah. Because they can't get food. So lots of times they'll just sit there. You know, if it's snowed like that, um, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll just sit and they won't get out and move or anything because uh, uh, there's no food for there's them. To, to yeah. They're, you know, it, if they extend more energy than what they consume food, then why move? 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're smart. Yeah. Yeah, they 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 they're kind of kind of tricky sometimes. You know what they do, they're you know, you just never know what they're gonna do. And yeah. So let's see. I always like to hear stories. Uh, what is probably the most challenging hunt you've been on? Ooh. Most challenging would probably be mule deer in West Texas with a bow. I did it the first year with a rifle and it was too easy. The next year I went out with it with archery equipment and uh, spotting and stalking out there in that flat country. Cause and I say West Texas in the panhandle, there's just flat. We walked miles and miles and miles and miles. And I finally killed one. He wasn't a big buck, 135 inch deer or something like that. After walking, God, I don't know, probably 15 miles that day. They're all across this flat country and trying to, to get me to hide out there. I'm 6'1", 270 now. 6'1", 270, I really don't hide in that flat country where the biggest tree is <laughs> three foot tall. Yeah, so, when you tower over the trees. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I try to hide behind a tree and I'm sticking out on both sides, you know. Uh, that was probably the hardest one. I spent a lot of time crawling on the ground on that one. But, uh, I mean, it was just a lot of country, a lot of glassing, a lot of crawling, trying to get up into range to shoot them and dealing with the 30 and 40 mile an hour crosswinds. It, it, that, was, that was probably the tough one. It wasn't a, a real exceptionally hard hunt. Nothing really happened other than just having to walk a lot. And just, <laughs> I mean, that, that last – probably 300 yards I was on my hands and knees crawling through you know sticker bars trying to get up and I think I ended up finally taking a shot at 45 yards um <laughs> but that was probably one of the most difficult hunts I've been on yeah but, that would be and everybody to told me <laughs> yeah and mule deer aren't to me come coming from hunting whitetail and everything else they're not exceptionally spooky until you get within that certain little range and then they just kind of ease off and they just, this, well, like I said, I don't know enough about mule deer. They just kept easing off. They never really blew and left like a whitetail would. They just kept easing out of distance or out of range, you know, maybe it's just where I was hunting. Like I said, I don't know not near enough about mule deer. I've only hunted them twice in my life, but that's, <laughs> that's what it was. Well, you had them twice more than I have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they that that one was that one was probably one of the the physically most challenging hunt for me. I mean, down here in Texas, most everything we do is is sitting in a deer stand and and just sitting and waiting, you know. But I like to get out and move around and to, to spot and stalk with archery equipment. That was that was a tough one. I mean, in flat country. I mean, in brush country. You can. I mean, out here, I can I can probably get it done pretty easy spot and stalking. But out there, it was it's a totally different game totally different game but yeah that one it's one of my favorite mounts so <laughs> yeah. yeah that was yeah that was, that was good yeah it, you always have a lot of a lot of stories when you have some of those difficult hunts like that and you know there, there's always stories that you, you come back and different things and you know with up here in nebraska we had uh one morning I was in a tree stand and and I'm watching the frost form on my bow and all the tree branches as the sun's coming up the frost is forming on everything and and that was pretty cool and on the drive home there used to be now there's all houses there now but uh, there's a row of evergreen trees alongside the road and they were all frosted over and you know, I, that was a that was a cool morning you know when I went home from that yeah. You know, a lot of the a lot of the hunts that the coolest hunts I've ever been on are ones I really don't even harvest anything. A lot of them, it's just sitting out there and just watching deer and just seeing how they move. I love hunting the rut. Like I grew up down in South Texas, 
And there's something about that. Well, you, you've seen Cthulhu. You know what it's like down there. Yeah. There's something about that country on cold mornings, those cold, cold mornings where you're sitting there and it's foggy and that sun's coming up and you see them bucks chasing does and just blowing that, that steam out everywhere. Those are the hunts that stick out to me. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. And I didn't shoot nothing. It's just just sitting there and just watching. You know, there's just – you know, like you like you were saying, that Catula area, that South Texas brush country, there's something special about that country down there for a whitetail hunter. And to hunt the rut down there, I mean, I've hunted it my whole life, but I'm just as happy sitting there with just a pair of binoculars, nothing else. You know, those yeah. are the hunts, that, the, the deals that stick out more to me when you see those bucks fighting and just chasing does and just those – I don't know. That's what sticks out more to me than, than the actual hunt itself anymore. It seems like my progression, I don't want to say, how do I say this? My progression of a hunter has led me away from hunting more. From me personally pulling the trigger and watching other people or just, just sitting out there and just enjoying watching deer. You know what I mean? Yeah. So mine's changed a lot. So don't get me wrong. I still love to shoot. I do, but <laughs> I enjoy watching, I enjoy watching everybody else more, and I enjoy just watching deer. I mean, that's like right here. I mean, you can't see it now. It's dark, but sitting here on my porch, I've got a tank down here at the bottom and about five hundred yards away, and a lane cut out. And every evening, that's I sit there and watch deer all evening. When I get done working, I go do my stuff, eat dinner, and I sit down and I watch deer every evening. That's just that's the stuff that that I love. I just love deer. I love watching deer. I can sit there and do it all day, every day. Yeah, they're they're kind of interesting. And, and then when when you get some that are playing, you know, like like the fawns oh. are out there, they're playing and having a good old time. And you know, the the, the does are just kind of bouncing around, looking around, looking around. And um, I know yep. one time I was in, in a tree stand and and this doe and this fawn come walking by, and, and they stop and the the fawn bends down, and the doe walks off. This fawn is like. 10 yards from my tree stand. I'm sitting here watching this fawn as the doe walks off. I'm like, cool. So I get to watch this fawn the whole whole time and, you know, wait for the, the doe to come back and pick her up and take her off. And it's kind of weird. She, she bedded her fawn down right right next to a hunter. <laughs> That's neat. You know, That's I wasn't going to shoot. I wasn't going to shoot it, sure. you know, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm not shutting for does, you know. Now, if another doe come by, that wasn't the mother of that one. I was, I shot it, yeah. you know, but you sure. know, I still let that fawn go. And, and if the doe come back, I'd let the, the, the fawn and the doe take off. And, and, you know, it, it was just, you know, I wasn't going to shoot the fawn or the mother of the fawn. Um, you know, right. at, at that time, I mean, you know, truthfully, that, the fawn, age, that, that fawn would have been fine at that age to survive. Right. I'm sure. You know, it, it would have survived generally what, September, October. It's still, it's the, it's the principle. And I get that. I mean, I respect that. And, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't like shooting does until about March. Me personally, or March, obviously can't shoot. I meant to say November. Can't shoot does in March. I know that. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> talk about a slip there. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I want them babies to get up big enough, and then we'll shoot some does, you know. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's just that's my passion anymore. Is just watching the deer. I mean, that's that's my biggest thing. Is I just love watching deer. Yeah, that, it's it's interesting to watch them, and, and of course, it's always nice to go shoot them. But yeah, yeah. Well, it's been great talking with you, and and, and I'm sure yes, sir. you know we're we're gonna have we're gonna have some people uh, definitely. Uh, uh, check out your your hunt down there because it sounds like it'd be really cool to go down there and 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 shoot something that you wouldn't normally be able to shoot and and you know I got whitetail up here and 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 turkeys and 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 stuff like that but you know I think it'd be kind of cool to go down there and shoot something you know with the exotic animals that we don't get to see and and you know, oh, hunt yeah. some of those and and you know just take I get something a lot different. of people that come. Yeah, I get people that come through the gate and, and we're driving to the lodge and they're seeing animals run across the road and they're like, where are we? You know, you'll have African animals run across and then you'll have like Axis, Black Buck, Neil Guy, they're from India. 
So you'll have, you'll see some of them run across. And then, you know, it, there's no telling. I've got ostriches that hang around. I've got kangaroos that are, they're not here to hunt. They're just, they're my pets, you know, but um, there's, you're sitting in the blind. There's no telling what's going to walk out in front of you. And uh, it just makes for a fun sit because like I said, there's, you'll sit in a blind on any given day and see 10 different species easily, easily oh, 10 yeah. different species per sit. So it's, it's just a neat experience for somebody who's never done it. Al, even for somebody who hunts all the time, I mean, to sit out there and see that many different animals and uh, they, they don't hunt like white tail do. You got to hunt them totally different. So, yeah. but it's, it's definitely, it's definitely interesting. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. You know, there's something a little bit different and, and, you know, if we're going to go down there. And and you're around. So when you're done, when you're done hunting up north, you can come down here and hunt. Because our best access hunts aren't until the spring and in early summer, anyhow. Oh, oh yeah, a little bit, a little bit so, later. Yeah, we hunt year round, never stops. Well, you hunt hogs all year round, it right? The hogs. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> come, come down anytime. Do, yeah, do twenty-four hunt. hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, we hunt <laughs> hogs round the clock. But the the exotics in Texas, there's no seasons on them, so it doesn't matter. You can hunt them year round. It doesn't matter. Oh yeah, because you brought them in and you've raised them yourself, and it's correct. Yeah, they're they're not indigenous to Texas, so the state doesn't put any stipulations on them. Well, that that's good. Um, mm -hmm. You know that you do have something you can go down and hunt. You know, if you want to, you know, I need a I need to go hunt. You know, I want to go hunt, and it's summertime. Although hunting in Texas yep. in the summertime is is going to be a little little warm one. <laughs> So shorts and snake boots are appropriate hunting attire during the summer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and so, you know, and then get out and go three days pool. out there, and it's important oh, yeah. to find the, the those animals right away when it's that hot out because you don't have much time. Oh yeah, but oh for sure, yeah, we got to get them down quick. But we don't. Once we shoot, we don't waste no time. We're we're on them and we're we're getting that hide off of them pretty quick. Right. Yeah. That, that's kind of the key. And uh, one of the things I discovered up here, um, Mike and I, when we were, were hunting, we had one deer that was it just all, all full of dirt and stuff. And so we took the hose, we hosed it down, you know, just to get this dunk off, off the hide. And that hide peeled off so nice. I was like, Oh, so we started hosing them down every time, you know, we'd yep. hose it down that hide peels off really nice. And I don't know what it is, but, that that water just loosens that hide up. We just so huh. yeah. We've done that with pigs, similar stuff with pigs. I've never done it with deer, but we've done it a bunch of time with pigs. Yeah, you have to try it sometime on a deer, you know, just hose it down yeah. and it just it almost like it kind of separates. And it, you know, how you know the deer hide, you know, it's it's really hard and stuck. When you soak it mm -hmm. down, it's not stuck so hard. You can you can pull it off fairly easy interesting yeah i've done it yeah. with pigs i'll take scald in hot water especially when they've got a lot of fleas and ticks and i'll dump that on them and it'll kill those fleas and ticks and then you can go and skin them but it makes it high i'd loosen up a little. i guess it's the fat it makes that fat loosen up a little bit and then you can oh yeah you can get them skinned out pretty easy but i've never tried that with deer yeah you'll have to try it <laughs> well i'll do it this weekend yeah. we're gonna try it yeah <laughs> try it <laughs> Yeah, but, I, I expect to see a post in the group on, on, on how well it worked for you. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I was like, okay, that, that's something I hadn't really set, mentioned in the in the group, but yeah, that would be, yeah, something. How many soak, you know, the question, how many soak the hide before you skin your deer? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a totally new one for me, but it's dang sure worth trying. Yeah, yeah. We'll give it a shot this weekend, see what it does. Well, in in uh, in closing, what what would you like to tell our listeners? <sighs> Man, I don't know. Uh, if you ever get a chance, to Texas, come check it out, and I'd love for you to come home with me if you can. And I, I'm sure we'll have some take you up on it because it sounds like you have a great operation down there. And and uh, remind everybody what the name of uh, uh, the ranch is. 
So I'm Double S Ranch. You can find me at huntwithdoubles.com or feel free to call me. I got my phone with me. It never leaves my side at uh, 940-255-7373. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a, so, all that information yeah, in the link so you don't have to remember it all. But yeah, it's it's been really great talking <laughs> with you. And uh, Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk again. <laughs> Yes, sir. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, my name is Rory Canterbury, and I've been your host, Dan Archer Talk 101, and we'll see you on the next one.